In this lecture, we look at when you're implementing a strategy, developing your capabilities, getting ready to position yourself to proactively improve your strategic position. How does one organize all of this activity? You may be talking about 20 people. You may be talking about 150 people. You may be talking about 400 people, 1,000 people, 5,000 people, 10,000, 15, 20,000, 100,000 people, or even more than that. How do you organize all of this activity in order to be successful at building your capability? As you move further and further up the organization, or as your organization grows larger and larger, the problem of coordination and, co and organization becomes more and more significant. Um, what this particular lecture will do is, in a sense, it summarizes some of the very first things that you might have learned about business and how businesses are organized. But I'm hopeful that revisiting it right now at this particular point where we've talked about strategy and we've had a pretty significant deep dive over the last several years of what business is all about, but some of this will actually start to make a little bit more sense in terms of why one needs to think about organizing in different ways, how one size doesn't fit all, and how many organizations actually have quite a, quite a complex mixture of these various kinds of organizing strategies. Looking down the right-hand side of this particular chart, what we're trying to do is figure out your strategy, you're trying to think about what capabilities you need, what we just talked about, your selling capability, marketing, development, technology, whatever they all are, and also how you are planning on doing your decision making, whether you want to make the decisions yourself, whether you think the senior team might make the decisions, or whether you want to push those decisions further down into the organization. And that often, and we'll talk more about this in a, in a later lecture, but that latter part about decision making often depends upon where you feel the best information is available for the decision making. If you're dealing with what the customers need in their local environments, then it's pretty clear that you want that to be cent decentralized so that someone in a store could take, could make a customer happy. But if there's some new technology trend or some, something that's affecting the organization on a large scale, it may be that the people in the field aren't fully cognizant of what it is that is, uh, is impacting the business going forward, and those sorts of, of questions might be best addressed at a more national level, a more centralized level. So that also depends. The whole situation of organizing becomes an extremely complex one. So let's just talk about each of those four different kinds of organizing that you've talked about before, I believe, and you've probably even experienced before when you look into in different kinds of organizations, when you interface with businesses, if you work there or just as a customer or somebody that you're working with. The most, the simplest is called this, the line and staff structure, which simply means that you have people that do things that actually deliver products and services to the customers. That's the line organizations, the people that are out there talking to customers, getting a product, or else they're distributing the product, you know, sending it around, or they're making the product. Essentially, there's a long line, it's called the line, right, of decision making and coordination that directly delivers things to the customer. That's your line. Well, a lot of issues come up associated with that, like conning the widgets and reporting to governments and paying your taxes or hiring people and firing people and all of that, that aren't directly in line with serving customers. And those are called staff roles or staff jobs. So those kinds of people are the ones that are, are setting back and thinking about or taking care of the organization itself and the organizing needs that are there. Like, for example, travel budgets and making sure that people pay their, get reimbursed when they travel and they spend their own money, hiring new people, getting interviewed by the HR department, make sure the employees are taken care for and trained and all of these. Uh, the finance organization has those. Every organization has various staff roles. One of them is often planning, figuring out what your budget's going to be for next year and dealing with other organizations that are also staff organizations. Typically, your strategy and policy organizations can, are staff organizations within perhaps their own departments. So you might have in market development, 
or in, in, uh, excuse me, in the marketing organization, a product development group that is managing all the various projects or products and putting marketing plans out there in a very line-oriented uh, operation. But someone has to step back and say, what if? What if we change this? What if we change that? What if we uh, did a partnership with someone else? And those would typically be the, your staff organizations. So that's your line and staff structure. You want to make sure, as a manager, that the line is very clear and direct because that's how you implement change. Staff comes up with the ideas, perhaps, but the change is implemented because you press a button and it goes straight down the line to the customer. Right? So when you're executing strategy, you make sure that that line connection is in place. Staff is helpful, but you need a line connection. Without the line connection, it's very hard to get anything done. Uh, the next one that to, to think about is what's called the functional strategy. What this means is that you set up departments um, or something else that people specialize in. That way, whenever you have a whole bunch of people that do finance and accounting and they all sit together, they can learn from each other. There's also a, a utilization aspect of it. Some jobs, like closing the books, gets very, very busy uh, every quarter, whereas um, the having to, to take care of for perhaps paying all the bills gets busy every month. Um, maybe hiring people is seasonal. You get your college hires you know, right after graduation, that sort of thing. So those types of activities, you can share resources in some way if you put functionally people into the same operation. The skills can be transferred. You can substitute one person for another much easier than if you had a finance person, only a single one in every organization then every time something came up from a financial perspective, they would, that person would be called upon, they'd be very busy when the books are closing, and then they would have nothing to do for some other periods of time. So you get this utilization improvement, you get skills transfer, better training, um, you could compare one person to another for purposes of evaluations. There's lots of good reasons to put various functions into specific groups. Of course, like everything else, is a balance. Once everybody is in a particular group, you lose some of the benefits of them knowing their customer, their internal customer, that is. Uh, for example, the finance person, if they're in the finance organization, but they're working with the marketing team and product management team, but they're the finance group, um, they don't necessarily feel that same kind of loyalty that they do to the product as they do to their home organization. So there's some challenges associated with that. This. Uh, these challenges are somewhat addressed by this divisional organization, or the M form, they call it, multi-division structure, where you might oftentimes say, OK, this product family has its own business unit, and this other product family has its own business unit. Like you take an organization, for example, someone like Starbucks, they manage their stores one way, they manage their franchise stores one way, and their own stores one way. Those are different business units. They have an entire finance organization, HR organization, and that sort of thing. Well, some of those would be shared as well. But then they also have their, their goods that they distribute through other stores um, in a separate business unit. There you have what they say they have P&L responsibility within the division. That is the manager of that division. It's called a general manager. And that he or she would, underst would have a revenue line, and they would have costs, and they would do their accounting all the way up to the contribution, contribution of their division to the organization. So you would roll up all of their results into the, the overall organization's re results. Stepping back to the functional organization, the problem there is you have allocations and things from finance. But by and large, you don't really roll up the numbers except at the top level for the whole organization. You know what the products are selling for in the sales organizations. You know the marketing costs. You know the R&D costs. You know the administrative costs. And you roll that all up to the top. Um, that's, you lose some visibility and some, some decision making with respect to which products and services are being more successful. Multi-divisional ones allow you to push that down a little bit further so you can tell up a particular product line. For example, in, a, in an automobile uh, manufacturing company, if the truck line is, is, is successful and is profitable versus the SUV line or the smaller car line, um, you could tell how well they, they are performing as individual organizations. Um, these are getting uh, increasingly more complex, as you can see. And of course, the matrix structure relates to the idea that you have 
usually two bosses. One, you have a functional boss, which is the person that you're in your functional organization. I'm the finance people. I have a boss that's a finance person. But in addition, while I'm working in product management, I have um, a role and a boss in the product management organization. I essentially have two bosses. One boss writes your reviews and all that, but they do it with a lot of input from your from the uh, business unit boss. In this case, the product management team that I work on provides a lot of feedback, and my boss in finance gives me the, um, the review based upon that feedback. Those are matrix organizations that become very complex and difficult. So as you can see, as we're, what we're talking about here is building strategy and policy and how one builds capabilities to do that. You get people that are good at things. You get people that are organized well at things at doing them. In other words, they have a lot of individual skills, and those people work together. That's what we talked about earlier in an earlier lecture. But here, as you get larger and larger organizations, you have to make decisions about how those larger groups interact with one another and how one gathers data about success versus tries to get efficiencies in keeping people that have similar skills together so you can exchange and get better utilization out of the organization. All very complex problems. Now's a good time to revisit it when we think about how one actually is thinking about the strategic position and then coming up with initiatives going forward. So we'll continue with our discussion about capabilities and how one goes about moving the organization forward and developing those capabilities um, in the next lecture.